Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 9 a.m. session in the developer and open source track. As a reminder to our in-world and web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Dispatcher, a secure external script interface for OpenSim. Our speaker today is Mick Bowman. Mick is a principal engineer in Intel Labs and leads the Virtual World Infrastructure Research Project. His team develops technologies that enable order of magnitude scalability improvements in virtual environments, opening the door to new levels of immersiveness and interaction among players. Welcome all. Let's begin the session. Thanks. Um, uh, you know, as we were talking uh, beforehand, um, uh, last year I got a chance to come up here and talk a little bit about the backend services and the work that we had done for uh, uh, for Simeon um, on a robust um, alternative. This year I get to talk a little bit more about the interface to the simulator um, and some of the things that we've done to um, enable um, uh, more broad uh, interactions between uh, OpenSim and um, external technologies, whether they're databases or simulation engines or or just management scripts. Um, so uh, the talk's basically going to be about Dispatcher. Um, uh, it's a project that's available on GitHub, um, so you can grab the code there anytime you want, um, and feel free to contribute to it. Um, it's at least a start on and a reasonably um, uh, surprisingly complete, at least as far as uh, being usable for some external applications, uh, start on an API for uh, accessing the scene. So um, the, the dispatcher really came out of some work that we were trying to do um, probably two, three years ago, um, where we were trying to take uh, a Android phone and use it as a 3D mouse um, for controlling objects in the virtual world uh, in OpenSim. And so the basic idea was we ran an application on the phone. Um, uh, an object in world, if you touched it in a particular way, would generate a QR code. The phone would scan the QR code. Um, and create a binding between the object and the phone. Um, and that allowed you to send all of the sensor information on the phone um, into the object. And likewise, the object could actually project a web page on the phone so that you could actually get extended um, actions that you could take on the, on the object. And so we used it for driving cars and a few other things like that. Um, but what we found was that um, it really didn't work very well. Um, and the problem is that we just couldn't figure out what the right kind of interface was um, to connect to uh, the simulator, to bind the communication between the simulator um, and, and the phone that had all the right properties, that, that it could handle the data rates, that it could handle the computation, um, that it would be transportable across uh, different regions. And that's kind of where we got started. Um, on the work um, uh, on the dispatchers. We wanted to generalize um, uh, that interaction um, at some level. So extensibility in OpenSim um, can really come from several different ways. I mean, one of the nice things about the platform is that, that in some sense it has uh, too many hooks for things that you can, for places that you can add to it. Um, obviously, most of you who've done any kind of building have used um, per object scripts. Um, and if you've done any kind of serious coding with LSL, you are intimately aware of its limitations. Um, uh, again, it's really good for uh, managing an object or a link set, but if you're managing collections of objects, it really kind of sucks. Um, it's really good for uh, dealing with kind of simple data structures and simple applications that way. Um, but if you really have kind of 
complex things that you're doing, um, it breaks pretty fast. Um, it's it's hard to do, for example, simple uh, associative arrays and other things like that. Um, and if you have any kind of structured object that you're trying to manage, it just blows up, right? And and some of that, you know, the the JSON store modules that we have in OpenSim right now do allow us some level of uh, sophistication and data structures, um, but even then, the limitations of LSL are um, uh, apparent in the uh, APIs that we have to use it. So, so LSL is really good for doing interface kinds of things, for generating events and handling uh, interface kinds of events. But if you're doing something like um, uh, oh, we did a, a uh, gravity simulation with um, you know something on the order of a thousand objects um, trying to connect to one another, and it just I mean it, it does not work for that. So the other sort of common approach for doing these things is to come up with region modules, um, and region modules because it's C sharp because it has access to um, all of the internals in OpenSim, and I say all in in quotations. Um, uh, it, it, it's, um, it works really well if you can figure out how to get the import to work that you don't have cyclical dependencies in, um, uh, in your classes. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's C sharp, it's Turing complete. You can do whatever you want to do in it. Um, it does have some limitations on it. Um, specifically region modules have to be pre-compiled into uh, the simulator. Um, yeah, there was some work on, on dynamically loading them, and that kind of works, um, but it still means you have to have console access to it. So if you're programming behaviors through region modules, um, uh, the consistency of your experience is going to be um, kind of limited. Um, so works really well, and, and we've got several out there. Um, I think the way that we ended up doing the the gravity simulation was uh, through a region module that specifically exports um, uh, a simulation engine on that for for end body problems. Um, but again, it works in in one location. Kind of underlying the the struggle that we had in trying to figure out how to work with an external application that wanted to come in and actually manipulate. Um, the scene is that there really is no API. I mean, you could go back and you kind of look at uh, the implementation of the LSL and OSSL functions as as one version of the API. But there's so much LSL isms in it. Um, it's really limited in its data structures. Um, you're using uh, instead of associative arrays, you're using lists that are um, uh, that are encoding. Um, the bindings. Um, uh, the LSL API has functions for tangent and arctangent, which have nothing to do with 3D scenes in and of themselves. And most languages that you have already have those. So, um, so starting with LSL and the script interface and the set of functions that are exposed by the scripts is really not. Um, uh, it, it's really not a. Um, scene independent or language independent uh, method of accessing it. Region modules go clear to the other end, which, you know, because they expose everything, you get um, a scene object group and all of its glory. Um, and, and many of the things that are in the interfaces to scene object group are really intended for internal use. And, you know, I get to pick on Justin here because um, there was one of the changes that was made uh, in the uh, naming of some functions, which was a, it was a good modification to the name. It was the right thing to do, but all of the region modules that were invoking that particular function broke. Um, and so, um, you know, we now have a uh, version skew um, in the region modules, some of them that are designed for, um, for the older implementation. And some of them are designed for the newer implementation of that particular function. The, the behavior didn't change, it was just the name. And, and so we end up in these situations where it's really hard um, with the region modules to have any kind of predictability or any kind of migration on it. So it works once and it works for one version, 
but maintaining it because there's nothing to make consistent um, across it was was just very difficult for us. So it, it, that's kind of where we ended up with um, with going back and looking at the dispatcher. Um, so what we wanted to do was to architect something which was really a set of interfaces for um, the core functions of, of OpenSIM that were independent of any particular language um, that, was, that was being used to access it. And you'll see we'll talk later on, we've got libraries that allow us to do Perl and Python uh, uh, invocations and, and of course the obvious C-sharp stuff. Um, so the API that we came up with um, for, um, for the dispatcher uh, provides access to things related to the scene and, and um, uh, assets, objects, avatars, events. So for example, we do things like um, we're able to pull down uh, an avatar's appearance, um, store it locally, serialize it, store it locally, and then reapply it. Um, we can make uh, changes in location where an avatar is moved or any of the objects. So there's a set of, of operations for dynamics on it. We can take an object uh, link set that's in the scene and generate the asset out of it and store that locally. And then when we want to, to recreate it, we can upload the asset um, and manage that. Um, there's also, like I said, a set of event handlers, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know things like touch events, um, that allow external bindings so that the uh, simulator really can be used uh, in a sense as a front end for behaviors that are defined in other places. Um, the dispatcher is also intended to be language and transport independent. By language independent, I mean that it's not bound, the data structures themselves are not bound up into any particular programming language. So it's not LSL. Um, it really is independent of uh, of the programming language that you have. And like I said, we've gone back and we've got Python, Perl, C-sharp client implementations that you can, that you can uh, use for scripting. And it's, not, it's really not hard to extend it out. Um, the idea behind the transport independence is that we wanted the API to be able to support, um, that, that the API itself should not be dependent on the lower level encoding of uh, the capabilities. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't want to bind ourselves too early to, per, for example, you know, just the things that HTTP can doing with, with synchronous calls, um, uh, or particular message encodings. Um, you know, we wanted to be independent of the set of, uh, set of codings that we have. And so, um, it really is a pretty hard layered model with uh, a transport layer, um, a presentation layer managing the encoding of the interface of the messages themselves, um, a message layer, and the message layer is really where all of the, the interesting API definitions are, 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 uh, exist, and then a, a message handler layer. Um, and that's how it ended up um, being divided up. Um, we wanted high performance. You know, we're driving a bunch of external simulations that are high-end simulations, and we're trying to use OpenSim as a visualization for that. And so what we really wanted was physics engine kind of performance. Um, so uh, thousands of updates per second, the ability to handle thousands of updates per second. Um, and then the final thing is, is that that it has to have some security model. And, you know, we're a little different because of the connections that we have and the applications, uh, a little different than the security model that would exist in OpenSIM. It's not, it's not per object, it's per class of operations. Um, and that's really um, uh, what we're trying to, um, uh, to make available through the security model is, is um, to associate, you know, a, a severity level with the with the set of functions, um, and then uh, require authenticated access um, to those functions. So um, the next two things I'm going to show are just a couple of of demos, um, and it's just videos for it. Um, uh, I've got a region that's up and running with the traffic simulation stuff um, that. 
Uh, I don't think I have the hypergrid URL in here for you, but um, if you ask me afterwards, I'll get that for you. Um, the first one is just a simple Perl script that um, generates um, uh, uh, Penrose tiles for a region. Um, and so if you're familiar with Penrose tiles, it's, you know, there's basically four shapes that allow you to, to um, code any region um, to cover any two-dimensional space. Um, uh, so with uh, one of the ways of doing the implementation, I mean, you really can't do it in LSL because there's too much math um, to do a performance, uh, to do a good job on the performance of it. Um, so we pulled all of the sort of tile generation stuff out into an external Perl script. Um, the Perl script is then resing a bunch of objects. Each of the objects, again, it's taking advantage of the, um, the JSON res object so that it that it's given a chunk of JSON um, as its start parameter, which is basically tells its orientation um, and size. Um, uh, just a moment, yes. Okay, okay so for those, yeah, for those who aren't able to get the video in world, I'm seeing it on my screen, but um, yeah, media on option is not being very reliable, but there's the YouTube link. Anyway, oh, I was okay. watching. Yeah, so I've got that one, and I'll uh, let me post the second one up there as well. Just a moment. Okay, so try those two links um, if you can't um, if you can't see what's what's going on on the first one. Um, but basically, it, you know, again, the 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 first link that I posted is the Penrose Tyler. Um, it generates about mm, I think it's something on the order of two thousand objects um, in the um, uh, in the, the video that I just posted um, in about a minute. When it does that, so it's you know it's pretty fast in in its connections to things. Um, the nice part about it is is that that the script itself you know can take a, a different center point for it can take different sizes and shapes for the amount of space that it wants to cover, and all of the computation for those kinds of things is is written in Perl, um, and so it's really nice to be able to do that. Um, we also have I mean there's if if you go out to the GitHub repository, um, there's an administrative function that allows you, for example, very conveniently through from the command line to delete all objects that have a certain pattern. Um, so, um, so yeah, Krista, the, the uh, script that generates the Penrose tiles is all is written in Perl. Um, and I'll come back to its kind of anatomy in a minute. Um, the second uh, video, again, if this works on the screen, that's great, but I posted the, the link um, in URL. Hey, be nice with the Perl comments, Krista. Um, but the second one is um, uh, just some of the output of work that we're doing on um, driving some um, uh, traffic simulation. Um, and so we're actually, you know, it, the, the project that I'm working on in Intel is actually looking at um, uh, transportation data, location data uh, for collections of, of people, um, how that data um, can, uh, can be used to identify individuals and then different ways that we can actually protect the identity of the individuals uh, based on the location data. And what's really hard for us to actually go out and, and get that data from people because the very act of getting the data is a potential privacy problem. Um, so we're using simulation in order to generate the data. Well, it turns out that traffic simulators are notoriously finicky um, when it comes to uh, layout. Um, and so we needed a good, fast way where we could actually watch the traffic easily um, and see where the hotspots were, where, you know, where are the traffic jams actually coming up. And the visualization for Sumo, which is the traffic simulator that we're using, which is, you know, one of the more popular uh, traffic simulators, um, really kind of sucks. And so we connected it into OpenSim um, uh, in order to run uh, the visualization. And 
what we've got, and, and you can see a little of this um, in the scene. I think the, the, the video that we have up there is something on the order of, of about 700 active cars um, at the time that we were uh, running the video. Um, uh, every one of the cars is, is having Sumo's updating its position, something on the order of five to seven times per second. Um, and we're driving those position updates into OpenSim. Um, the dynamics um, messages that the dispatcher um, uh, interface provides um, allows us to, uh, to batch up dynamics um, calls. Um, uh, we can have multiple threads executing simultaneously on it. And so we're actually able to pump something in the order of, of several thousand updates per second um, uh, on the dynamics in there. Um, and the problems we have are, are as much because of the viewer as anything. Um, you know, we have to get velocity and angular velocity, or velocity acceleration, angular velocity, uh, angular acceleration, and things like that in order for the interpolation to work well um, in the viewer. And all of that's done. And so it actually works remarkably well. It looks really smooth, even with, with several thousand cars um, in the region. So the... The architecture for this is really, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, we've got OpenSim with no, with no uh, Sumo specific code in it. All it's running is the dispatcher with the interface that's, export, that's exported. All of the intelligence about driving object updates, about where the cars need to be moved, for example, and how to res them, um, is done in a bunch of Python code. Um, uh, which is connected to the Sumo simulator. So uh, Sumo is driving the position of the cars. It sends a set of updates to our Python code. The Python code turns around um, and makes the updates um, to the objects that are in, in OpenSim. And, and, you know, if you watch it real time, it, it really is approaching physics engine kind of performance on that um, in order to get it to move. Um, and yeah, the getting the interpolation right was, um, I should say, the most challenging part of the code was not getting it to perform, not getting the dispatcher to perform, but to figure out exactly how the interpolation was working in the viewer so that we could make the movement of the cars as smooth as possible. So it was um, a challenge um, uh, that we can talk about in a different, in a different situation. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the about the dispatcher architecture itself. Um, uh, at the lowest level, we support both HTTP and UDP transports. Um, every it, the, um, the dispatcher is message oriented. Um, uh, there's a set of messages uh, and message types, and then there's a set of uh, protocols for connecting request messages uh, with response messages. Um, uh, there's also a callback mechanism which allows you to send a message that requests the creation of a callback, um, and then certain operations we'll use will uh, will have a callback um, interface uh, into the request message, and so the results for any asynchronous operation um, can be passed back through the the callback interface. Um, in order to get that messaging interface at the bottom level, we've got. Um, synchronous and asynchronous transports, HTTP and UDP. Um, the messages um, and message types are all currently encoded in either JSON or BSON, um, but there's nothing particularly limiting about that. Um, uh, the messages themselves at the messaging layer are independent of their encoding, and so you could use protocol buffers if you wanted, or some other wonderful, um, highly efficient binary encoding if you want. What we found is that um, with uh, JSON in particular, we have some limits on um, uh, the um, the decoding of the uh, uh, JSON code. Um, but as soon as we went to vSON for the encoding for it, um, things got much, much faster on the decode. It, it sped up the decode performance by um, about 200%. Um, uh, which provides us a lot of really nice um, 
performance advantage is that. So, so you can use JSON in cases where you really don't care because it's really easy to generate the JSON. Uh, you can use BSON uh, in cases where you, where you want performance, but it's a little harder to debug the BSON. Um, at the messaging layer, there are um, message domains. Um, and each of the domains has um, uh, some different kind of... Um, uh, so, Tony, just one comment about the... Uh, parsing strings in JSON is slow, um, but there are really good JSON parsers. Uh, the BSON is a, a uh, binary encoding with string links explicitly included in it, um, so the performance of BSON parsing is is much faster because it's it's almost explicit. Um, okay, so back to the messaging layer. Um, so each one of those has a set of domains. There's there are two domains that are um, uh, actually I left one out. There's three domains that are that are specific to uh, the operation of the dispatcher itself. Um, there's the information, which is the, the interface query. Basically, it says, what messages does this um, endpoint support? Um, so it allows interrogation. Um, the authentication is really about creating and destroying and renewing capabilities, and I'll talk about how they play a role in the security uh, in a minute. Um, and then the third one that's in there is the, is the endpoint management that I, that I already talked about a little bit, and I'll come back to in a second. Um, and then there are domains of objects related to asset management, um, to avatar positioning and appearance, uh, communication, which allows us to send messages into the region and receive messages from the region, um, uh, objects for, uh, for doing everything from interrogating object inventory to creating objects to moving objects um, to resizing and repositioning. Uh, there's a set of dynamics uh, related to that. Um, there are messages for managing the region, for doing administrative functions on the region, um, uh, terrain objects, and, and then a whole class of event objects as well. Uh, and like I said, we've got implementations in C Sharp, Perl, and Python right now for the clienting. So th just, this is just gives you an idea of the uh, kind of structure um, of the um, uh, messages that we have. So there's a base request message, um, which is how we attach all of the encoding and decoding of the messages themselves. Um, and that base message has some, uh, some properties that are available um, uh, across. And, and the one that I would point out here, every message has a capability that goes with it, and that's how we actually allow um, uh, the uh, security to be enforced. Um, so rather than having to go back and re-authenticate everyone, you generate the capability, the capability is stored. The capability that's associated with it gives you access and permissions to execute or to perform uh, messages in a particular domain. And then the find object request sits on top of that, and it's just a set of parameters that could be passed in. Um, uh, in this case, there's a set of queries that could be performed on the region, um, both in terms of uh, the space over which you're looking for things, the pattern for the name on it, and owner ID. And for each of the request messages, there's a response message. In some cases, the request itself is intrinsically um, uh, asynchronous. So, for example, I want to register an event handler for a touch event. Um, there's still a response that can be generated for that, uh, which is basically um, the response that comes back is the capability uh, from the server, uh, which will allow the um, uh, client to know for sure that the messages that are coming back from the server are coming back as a result of that event. Um, the find objects response, every one of the response messages has a success and a, and a message as to whether or not it was useful. And then there's, there's response specific stuff. So in this case, the find objects sends a pattern over and what comes back is a list of object IDs um, that match that response. Um, so it, it's not particularly difficult to figure out how to use this. Um, you create a capability um, and once you've got the capability set up, you just start sending messages and waiting for the responses. If you don't care about the responses, you can set up 
uh, an asynchronous um, request, in which case the responses are simply dropped. Um, and that's, that's actually pretty useful if you're doing, for example, dynamic stuff where you really don't care about um, the success because you're going to overwrite it again in a couple of minutes anyway. Um, when we've got the callbacks, it's basically request the capability, create the endpoints, and the endpoint is a data structure that's stored on the server, um, which allows the server uh, to send messages back to the client um, on a particular pattern. Right now, honestly, the only thing we have implemented is, is UDP callbacks um, uh, for the remote endpoints. Um, and for the kind of applications we have, that actually works really well. It's not that hard to extend it out so that we get both uh, HTTP and UDP-based uh, callbacks on it. All right. Uh, whoops. Let me go back to the security one. We're almost done. Um, so the, the generation of the capability is, again, pretty straightforward. And um, you provide it with the information about either your user ID or your email, whatever it is um, that the particular authentication scheme requires, um, the hashed password that goes along with it. Um, and, and really, the, in, the most interesting parts on the capability is the lifetime um, and the domain. So capabilities have limited life. Um, the server can set a, a maximum lifespan on a capability. Uh, if it wants, for example, to make sure that the capability is not misused, it can say, you know, you're going to be required to, to re-authenticate your capability every 60 seconds. Um, and that's, that, that's, if you're doing dynamics, that's, that's not bad. Um, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. If you're doing administrative operations, it tends to be okay as well. Um, for doing development, you want them longer because you don't, because re-authenticating is, is not fun. Um, the capability, there's a capability response message which, which comes back to the client, uh, which includes endpoint information and the capability itself. Um, and then you simply stick that capability inside all the messages that you're sending. The domain gives us a way of limiting um, the scope over which a particular client application uh, can get access. So administrative functions, for example, administrative messages um, uh, generally require an account with uh, account status over 200, um, and that's basically what we're doing. Um, okay, so again, I'm running a little late, so I'm going to uh, just close up with the next two slides and we'll be done. Um, so the kind of applications that we've actually built with this thing, I'm, you know, we already saw the external content um, with the Penrose tiles. Uh, we've done the external sensors, and this actually works really well. So uh, we have system monitoring tools that are generating um, uh, events that are being sent into, um, into the world, and we can actually take actions based on those. Um, so we've done it with the phone that I mentioned at the beginning and some server stats. Um, most of what our work is right now is on data visualizations, where we're actually using um, OpenSim uh, simply as a 3D interface um, for uh, some rich uh, simulations um, that we're doing on the back end. Um, there's also a bunch of region administration things, so you can actually clean up regions and move objects around in regions and things like that. The two that are kind of interesting here that I'll, that I'll come back, and by the way, uh, Tony, let's bring up the question about how fast things are later um, uh, in the Q&A. Um, but uh, one of the nice things is that um, I'm running really thin on inventory these days because all my inventory is actually stored in a Google Drive. Um, it's just a file system based inventory interface um, that allows me to build, build objects in a region and then grab them and store them in the file system. So I've got all of my grep, ls, mv, and everything else that I need locally um, to manage my inventory, um, which was really bloody convenient when you're talking about several thousand things. And the fact that it's on Google Drive means that it's available anywhere. Um, so it's, it's really convenient to have that. Um, and the other thing that we've been poking around with, which is, which is not functional at this point, is the ability to do scene replication. Um, uh, most of what we have um, in DSG was a kind of custom replication protocol, and it was really exceptionally hard to do. Um, and what a lot of people were asking for was just, I, you know, I don't need to necessarily interact with everyone. But what I want to do is have a copy of the scene so that I can see all of the actions that are being taken. Um, 
And the dispatcher interface is, I'll say, really close at this point to being able to uh, track object updates in one scene and propagate all of those updates, including avatar movements, avatar appearances, uh, object movement um, from one place to the other. What we don't have, you know, there's, you know, the support for building and other things like that obviously is not there, which was which was nice for DSG work. Um, but but it's more like uh, the replicated scene is kind of like uh, consuming a movie. Um, we're actually in it, so you can actually see everything that's moving around. Um, it's not bi-directional at this point. Um, so, uh, Justin, the the justification for scene replication is really scale and performance. Um, uh, and there are also some security issues um, that we wanted. Uh, yeah, the military exactly, um, where you've got one place where things are really happening and everybody else is simply able to look at it or look at a subset of what's happening in a particular region. So um, that came out of some conversations with Doug before. All right, um, so I think that's it. Um, Dispatcher is an open sim. It is a region module that's currently implemented as well. It's actually a collection of region modules. Um, it's really easy to extend because you just you, you define a new message um, in a in a structured object, um, and then you just have to implement the handlers uh, for that message. Um, it's secure, not necessarily in a way that that you would want turned loose on a on a uh, kind of socially focused virtual world because it's not per um, per person. Um, but it is, or excuse me, it's not per object, but it is uh, per action on it. And um, back to the questions earlier about performance. Um, the only thing in OpenSim that can go faster right now as far as updating the scene is the physics engine, and I think we're close to that. Um, even with the BSON encoding, uh, or excuse me, with the BSON encoding and the performance that we get from that, um, we run out of uh, sumo cycles before we run out of open sim cycles when we're driving it today um, with the with the cars. Um, we do multiple concurrent streams with multiple threads um, in the open sim simulator. There's no intelligence whatsoever um, in in the simulator, so there's no local scripts that are executing. That's where we get the performance. Is that open sim does nothing but pass the service as a multiplexer for passing updates out to the endpoints. Um, so all of the computation is moved off on the backend server. Um, and the only thing that's really running is 3D manipulation. Um, and that's why, that's where we get the performance, um, is that you're not sharing, you're not sharing cycles like the physics engine does with, with the simulator itself. Um, so, uh, that's that's the real win that we get out of here on the performance. Um, and the nice thing is, it it <laughs> I'm sorry, it's really nice to be able to use Emacs and Perl and Python in order to write scripts rather than trying to figure out how to get LSL to work it and trying to figure out how to dig through the appropriate scene object group and scene object part um, APIs in order to figure out where the right uh, the right calls are. Um, the wrappers for um, yeah, Krista. Yeah, um, but the wrappers for um, the client objects, because it's just encoded JSON and BSON, adding new clients is trivial. Uh, client language is trivial. So, <laughs> all right, that's all I had for now. Um, thanks very much. Questions? Um, I'm as far as the current version of OpenSim. You know, this goes back to my comment about Justin changing the names on the uh, on the scene object group APIs. Um, it really works with um, just uh, the the dev master at this point. Um, so it's been updated for I guess the the code changes were about what two months ago, Justin something like that. Okay, um, I'll hang around here for a little bit, but I would say um, 
uh, I'll just hand it back over to James and, and say thank you very much. Um, it's another great conference, and I hope we continue to do this. Thank you, Mick, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. In this room, the next session will be scaling Open Simulator inventory using NoSQL with Tranquility Dexter at 10 a.m. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience. We'll be back shortly with the next sec session.